let's explore some solutions with Dynamic SQL. Now, some folks have an allergy to Dynamic SQL. Some people love it. I am definitely in the love it camp, but I do completely admit that the quality of your Dynamic SQL will directly, you know, influence how much you like Dynamic SQL. So it's a very flexible tool. And like a lot of really flexible tools, that means it can be great or it means it also can be a real bear, depending on how well it's documented, how clearly it's written, and whether any help has been made to make it easier to debug if it gets really complex and then you run into problems. So it, it can be absolutely a problem to deal with, but if you are responsible with it, it's not always that bad. Our first dynamic SQL procedure we're gonna look at is starting out pretty simple. I'm gonna go ahead and create it first. What we're doing is we are declaring a couple of local variables. And then we are setting our first name ID, querying from ref.firstName, and then generating a dynamic SQL query, which plugs in that first name ID value. We're executing that with SP execute SQL and executing it as parameterized dynamic SQL. Parameterizing this and using the first name ID parameter, I didn't just plug it in as a literal value. This means that my dynamic SQL will actually be able to reuse execution plans. If I didn't parameterize this and I just sort of concatenated in the value for first name ID, then every time I ran this, I would get a different plan for each first name ID. I then would have, you know, like how, how has this performed over the last 10 runs? Well, I have 10 different execution plans in my cache. They aren't reusing one another. That's really hard to monitor. And if I get into a habit of doing this in all of my code, I just have no reused plans and they're having to be purged out of memory. And I've just kind of got this big mess. So that, that isn't a good practice. Instead, I have used parameterized dynamic SQL. Now, there are some exceptions to this when you don't want to parameterize your dynamic SQL in specific situations. I'm not saying this is 100% always the best thing. It's just often best to parameterize your dynamic SQL. I'm going to clean out my buffer pool for my whole instance, my private test instance. And let's go ahead and run this for Matthew. So it figures out Matthew's first name ID, plugs that into the dynamic SQL, and we do get a plan that is optimized for Matthew. By passing that first name ID into the dynamic SQL and, you know, saying here's what the first name ID is, we were able to create a parameterized reusable plan that was able to use the histogram. But what if it doesn't run first for Matthew? We are allowing execution plan reuse. So I'm gonna say, okay, the next time you run this procedure, or the next time, actually I've put in the table name here, the next time any query accesses this table, any query or procedure or whatever, it needs to get a fresh plan. This, by the way, does take out a high level lock against that table. I'm in a totally private test environment, so that doesn't matter. But if you ever were to run this command against a table in a busy production environment, you could potentially cause a big blocking chain. So be aware of that. I am going to then do my buffer cache trick. And then I'm going to run this for Faye. And I'm letting it cache the execution plan for Faye. Now, Faye is super fast when she gets her own plan because it's optimized for her first name ID. She gets a nice little nested loop plan and her actual number rows is 508. Let's look at the key look up here and just verify that yes, her estimate was just around 3000 ballpark for her. She only has 508. It's a good estimate for her clearing out my buffer pool, my data cache, but not clearing out my execution plan cache, right? My execution plans are still there. So now when I run this for Matthew, he's going to reuse phase plan because I parameterized the dynamic SQL and allowed plan reuse. So depending on who runs first, 
I'm either gonna get a little plan in cache that has nested loops, or I'm gonna get a big plan in cache that has a clustered index scan. And when the little plan is in cache and this runs for Matthew, sure enough, I get the 11 second run with uneven performance. So this version of Dynamic SQL, this version of the solution, there's good things about it, but there's bad things about it too, because now I've got this parameter sniffing situation where it's depending on who, who gets into cash, I'm gonna have different, and who it's running for, I'm gonna have different performance. So we can improve on this and do better to get more consistent performance with our dynamic SQL. We could go back to recompile and combine it into our dynamic SQL. In this procedure, we're using our same dynamic SQL pattern as last time, but I have added into my dynamic SQL a recompile hint and said, optimize this query for the first name ID that you're passing in. This recompile hint means don't reuse anyone else's plan and don't let anyone else reuse my plan. So let's clear out our execution plan cache and let's run this for Faye. Faye's super fast. She gets her really nice little nested loop plan. That's terrific. Clear out our cache and run this for Matthew. And Matthew, hey, it's it's compiling fresh for his first name ID. He gets his four second run, which is fast for Matthew. And he got his clustered index scan with that estimate of 1.45 million rows. This is why recompile hints can sneak into so much production code because everybody gets their own plan. And with certain ways that we rewrite our SQL, sometimes that can give us great performance, but once we start letting this into our code, we start getting this into more and more code, it becomes very difficult to monitor because it's not staying in our cache for long. If we have query store enabled on 2016 and higher, that gets easier, but we're burning CPU for all those compiles and eventually this habit catches up with us so I avoid this if I can have a better way. And there is a better way. We have another option for dynamic SQL, which is to branch our dynamic SQL. Still use a parameterized dynamic SQL, but branch it off and coerce SQL Server into giving us a big plan and a small plan. I'm gonna go ahead and compile this stored procedure. This one is name count by gender D SQL optimized for. And in this, I've added a variable at the top. I've added a local variable named total name count. My first query now doesn't just figure out what the first name ID is. It also figures out what the total name count is. Now in our case, total name count is actually just a ballpark estimate. In ref.firstname total name count represents the total names across all the time we have history for, which is from the, like the 1880s to 2015, our query is actually just looking at a subset of that data from 1966 to 2015, but this ballpark is good enough. And in some cases, you might not have a column like this to help you, and in some cases, you might just have a couple of things that are outliers. And you might just say, for these specific values, I wanna do this, for other names, I wanna do a second query. So there's different ways that you might branch this. We just happen to have a total name count column. What I'm saying here is when the total name count is over 1 million, I wanna set the dynamic SQL to this query, which has got an optimized for hint in there. This optimized for query hint tells SQL Server, I want you to optimize this query plan for a specific first name ID. And in this case, I picked Matthew as the representative of the popular names. If there aren't more than a million of these, I want you to use this different query syntax, which has an optimized for hint in it that says, I want you to optimize this for the first name ID of Faye's first name ID. She's the representative of the more unique names. We then are still using the parameterized dynamic SQL so we can have execution plan reuse. So this means I'll have 
two different execution plans at most. They'll be able to be reused, so I won't burn a ton of CPU compiling them. I won't pollute my execution plan cache, but I can still have a plan for I've got a lot of names and a plan for I don't have a lot of names. They are not tied into any specific index. I haven't forced scanning. I haven't forced a specific index. So if indexes are improved on our table, they, they might both adapt and start essentially doing the same thing with a better index and just be two execution plans, but that's not too terrible, right? So let's make sure I created this. I, I talked so much I couldn't remember. And we'll clear out our data cache and we'll go ahead and we'll run this first for Faye. Now, Faye comes back really fast. There's the first query that is figuring out the total name count. I actually don't have the perfect index for that, so it got a little comp more complicated. And then we have a nice nested loop query. That's the small plan for Faye, which works great for her. If I click on this little dot, dot, dot next to my T SQL, I can even see that this is the dynamic SQL that was optimized for Faye for the uh, less frequent names. I'm gonna clear out my cache again, and I'm gonna run this for Matthew. And now Matthew should hit that branch where there's more than a million names for Matthew. And I didn't force a recompile on this, but it hit that branched code and sure enough, the second query for Matthew is doing, let's see if we can get a little more real estate on the screen. It's doing that clustered index scan. <laughs> My execution plans take up too much room. It's doing that clustered index scan and we have you know, the estimated number of rows, the familiar 1.45 million. Clicking on the three dots for the query, I can see that it used the branch of the dynamic SQL that optimizes for the more popular names. So this, this can be really flexible. The main downside of this is that, well, dynamic SQL can make troubleshooting and maintaining code trickier. We've added complexity. Also, in some cases, you may not have a reliable branching criterion like we have. It may be that you write a database and you've got, you know, different clients using different versions of this database and they have really different data distribution and different you know, values in these tables. In that case, doing this dynamic SQL fix may not be meaningful at all because you, you might, you're, we get into trouble if we optimize for a first name ID that doesn't exist, right? So there's certain scenarios where this might be a great fix and then other scenarios where this particular one is actually not that good. And in those other scenarios, maybe a force scan hint is the best choice, or maybe in that scenario, maybe actually changing the index is the best choice too, right? We've got sort of different constraints on different environments. I do like this dynamic SQL a lot, but if I'm going to go with dynamic SQL, I may need to add some complexity to it to make sure that I'm not compiling things too often, I'm getting the right amount of plan reuse for my scenario and also consistent performance for all of the different ways that the query might run. So this can be a great solution for this particular problem. I don't think there is a one size fits all solution, which I think is actually why I like this scenario so much.